Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City for AWS Amazon Web Services Summit 2022. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host. We are breaking it down, getting an update on the ecosystem as the GDP drops, inflation's up, gas prices are up. The enterprise continues to grow. We're seeing exceptional growth. We're here on the ground floor live at the Summit's packed house, 10,000 people. Eric Bradley's here, Chief Strez at ETR one of the premier enterprise research firms out there, partners with theCUBE, and powers our breaking analysis that Dave does. Check that out, it's the hottest podcast in enterprise. Eric, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate the collaboration always. Yeah, all, great stuff. Your data is amazing, ETR. Folks watching, check out ETR. They have a unique formula, very accurate. We love it. It's been moving the market. Congratulations. Let's talk about the market right now. The, this market is booming. Enterprise is the hottest thing. Consumers kind of in the toilet. Okay, <laughs> I said that, all right. Back out devices and, and, and consumer, enterprise is still growing. And by the way, this first downturn in the history of the world where hyperscalers are on full pumping on all cylinders, which means they're still powering the revolution. Yeah, it's true. The hyperscalers were basically uh, this two-sun uh, system when Microsoft and AWS first came around and everything was orbiting around it. And we're starting to see that sun cool off a little bit, but we're talking about a gradient here, right? When we say cool off, we're not talking a shutdown. It's still burning hot, that's for sure. And I can get into some of the macro data in a minute if that's all right, or do you want me to go right yeah, go, now? Go, go right in. Yeah, so right now we just closed our most recent survey and that's macro and vendor specific. We had 1,200 people talk to us on the macro side. And what we're seeing here is a cool down in spending. We originally had about 8.5% increase in budgets. That's cooled down to 6.5 now. But I'll say with the doom and gloom and the headlines that we're seeing every day, 6.5% yeah. growth coming off of what we just did the last couple of years is still pretty fantastic as a backdrop. Okay, so you, you started to see, John mentioned consumer, we saw that in Snowflake's earnings, for example. And we, and we certainly saw you know, Walmart, other retailers, uh, the fa Facebooks of the world where consumption was being dialed down certain Snowflake customers, not necessarily, they didn't mention any customers, but they were able to say, all right, we're going to dial down consumption this quarter. Hold on, so we saw some of that in Snowflake results and other results, but at the same time, the rest of the industry is booming, but your data is showing softness within the Fortune 500 for AWS. Not only AWS, but Fortune 500 across the board. Okay. So going back to that larger macro data, the biggest drop in spending that we captured is Fortune 500 which is surprising, but at the same time, these companies have a better purview into the economy in general. They tend to see things further in advance, and we often remember, they spend a lot of money, so they don't need to play catch up. They'll easy, more easily be able to pump the brakes a little bit in the Fortune 500, but to your point, when we get into the AWS data, the Fortune 500 decrease seems to be hitting them a little bit more than it is Azure and GCP. I mean, we're still talking about a huge business, right? I mean, they're catching uh, up. I mean, huge. Amazon has been transforming from owning the developer cloud, startup cloud, decade ago to really put a dent in the enterprise as being number one cloud. And I still contest that they're number one by a long ways, but Azure kicking ass and catching up, okay? You're seeing people move to Azure. You got Charlie Bell over there, Sean Bice, former Amazonians, Teresa Carlson. People are going over there, there's lift over at Azure. There and certainly is. Is, is there but, kinks in the armor for AWS? There's a couple of kinks, but I think your point is really good. We need to take a second there. If you're talking about true pass or infrastructure as a service, true cloud compute, I think AWS still is the powerhouse. And a lot of times the, the, the data gets a little muddied because Azure is really a hosted platform for applications. And you're not really sure where that line is drawn. And I think that's an important caveat to make. But based on the data, yes, we are seeing some kinks in the armor for AWS. Yeah, explain. So right now, a first of all, a caveat, 40% net score, which is our proprietary spending metric, across the board. So we're not like raising any alarms here. It's still strong. That said, there are declines, and there are declines pretty much across the board. The only spot we're not seeing a decline at all is in container spend. Everything else is coming down. Specifically, we're seeing it come down in data analytics, data warehousing, and ML AI, which is a little bit of a concern because that, that rate of decline is not the same with Azure. Okay, so I got to ask, macro, I see the headwinds on the macro side. You pointed that out. Is there any insight into any underlying conditions that might be there on AWS, or is this a chronic kind of situational thing? Uh, right now it seems situational other than that correlation between their big Fortune 500 you know, audience. 
and that being our biggest decline. The other aspect in the macro survey is we ask people if you are planning to decline spend, how do you plan on doing it? And the number two answer is taking a look at our cloud spend and auditing it. So they're kind of say, all right, you know, for the last 10 years it's been drunken sailors spending. <laughs> I was going to use that same line. <laughs> you know, yeah, on just cloud spend, 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 just spend, spend. <laughs> and we'll figure it out later, who cares? <laughs> and then right now it's time to tighten the belts a little bit. But this is part of the allure of cloud. At some point yeah. you, you, you could say, you I'm going to I'm going to dial it down, right. I'm going to yeah. rein it in. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why people go to the cloud. I want to I want to focus in on the data sure. side of things and the specifically the database. Just to give some context, if, and correct me if I'm, I'm a little off here, but Snowflake, which is the hottest company you know, on the planet, their net score was up around 80% consistently. Yeah. It, it's dropped down the last mm -hmm. you know, quarter, last survey to 60%. So yep. still highly, highly elevated, but that's relative to where Amazon is much larger, but you're saying they're coming down to the 40% level. Is that right? Yeah, they are. And I remember you know, when I first started doing this 10 years ago, AWS had a 70% you yep. know, net score as well. So what's going to happen over time is those adoptions are going to get less, and you're going to see more flattening of spend which ultimately is going to lower the score because we're looking for expansion rates. We want to see adoption and increase. And when you see flattening of spend, it starts to contract a little bit. And you're right, Snowflake also was in the stratosphere. That cooled off a little bit, but still you know, very strong. And uh, AWS is coming down. I think the reason why it's so concerning is because A, it's within the Fortune 500, and their rate of decline is more than Azure right now. Well, and, and one of the big trends you're seeing in database is this idea of converging function, in other words, bringing transaction and analytics right. together. At Snowflake Summit, they added the capability to handle transaction data. MongoDB, which is largely tra mostly transactions, added the capability in June to bring in analytic data. You see Databricks going from uh, data uh, uh, engineering and data science now getting into Snowflake space and analytics. So you're seeing that convergence. Oracle is converging with MySQL Heatwave and, and their core couch, databases. Couchbase, Couchbase Maria is doing DB, the same. Maria do, MySQL. Right? So virtually all these database companies are, are converging their platforms with the exception of AWS. AWS is still the right <laughs> tool for the right job. So they've got Aurora, they've got RDS, they've got you know, uh, 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 a DynamoDB, you they've got going. Redshift, they got, they've yeah. got you know, <laughs> going on and on and on. And so the question everybody's asking is, will that change? Will they start to yeah. sort of cross those swim lanes? We haven't seen it thus far. How is that affecting the data performance? I mean, that's fantastic analysis. I think that's why we're seeing it, because you have to be in the AWS ecosystem, and they're really not playing nicely with others in the sandbox right now. The, now, I will say... Who, Amazon's not playing nicely? Well, no, no, simply to your point, though, that the other ones are actually bringing in others and consolidating other different vendor types. And they're really not. You, you know, if you're in AWS, you need to stay within AWS. Now, I will say, their tools are fantastic. So if you do stay within AWS, they have a tool for every job, they're advanced, and they're incredible. Uh, I think sometimes the complexity of their tools hurts them a little bit, because to your point earlier, AWS started as a developer-centric type of cloud. They have moved on to enterprise cloud, and it's a little bit more business-oriented, but their still roots are still DevOps friendly. And yeah. unless you're truly trained, uh, AWS can be a little scary. So a common use case is I'm going to be using Aurora for my transaction system, and then I'm going to ETL it into Redshift, right? And, and I, now I have two data stores, and I have two different sets of APIs and primitives, two different teams of yeah. skills, and so that is probably causing some friction and complexity in the customer base. The, again, the question is, will they begin to expand some of those platforms to minimize some of that friction? Well, yeah, this is the question I wanted to ask on that point. So I've heard from people inside Amazon, don't count out Redshift, we're making, we're catching up. I think that's my word, but they were kind of saying that. Right. Because Redshift is a good, good database, but they're adding a lot more. So you got Snowflake success, I think there's a little bit of a jealousy factor going on there within Redshift team. But then you got Azure Synapse, which yep. is a Synapse product. Synapse, yep. And then you got BigQuery from Google. BigQuery, yep. What's the differentiation? What are you seeing for the data, for the data? warehouse or the data clouds that are out there for the customers, what's the data say, say to us? Yeah, unfortunately the data is showing that they're dropping a little bit. Who's uh, they? Uh, AWS is dropping a little bit. Now of their data products, Redshift and RDS are still the two highest of them, but they are starting to decline. Now I think one of the great data points that we have, and we just closed the survey is, 
we took a comparison of the legacy data. Now, please forgive me for the word legacy. That's I'm going to okay. anger a few people. <laughs> but we got Teradata, Oracle on-prem. We've got IBM. Some of those more legacy data warehouse type of names. When we look at our, our survey takers that have them, where their spend is going, that spend's going to Snowflake first. And then it's going to Google. And then it's going to Microsoft Azure. And, and uh, AWS is actually declining in there. So when you talk about who's taking that legacy market share, it's not AWS right now. So legacy goes to legacy. So, <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> Microsoft. So, so it's worth doing a little context because Redshift really was the first to take, yes. you know, the, to take the database to the cloud. And they did that by doing a one-time license deal with ParXL, which was an on-prem database, and then they re-engineered it, they did a fantastic job, but it was still engineered for on-prem. Then, you, along comes Snowflake a couple years later, and true cloud native. Same thing with BigQuery, yep. true cloud native architecture, so they get a lot of props. Now, what, what Amazon did, they took a page out of, of the Snowflake, for example, separating compute from storage. Now, of course, what's, what, what Amazon did is, actually not really completely separating like Snowflake did. They couldn't because of the architecture. They created a tiering system that you could dial down the compute. So little nuances like that, I understand. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing from Snowflake is the gathering of an ecosystem in this true data cloud, bringing in different data types. They got to the public markets. Databricks was not able to get to the public yeah, markets, and I think is, is struggling. At a $25 billion valuation. Right, and so that's, that's going to be dialed down. Struggling somewhat from a go-to-market standpoint, whereas Snowflake has no troubles from a go-to-market. Yeah, yeah. They are the masters at go-to-market, and so now they've got momentum. We talked to Frank Slootman at the Snowflake Summit. He basically said, I'm not taking the foot off the gas. No way. Yeah, we, a few of our large you know, consumer customers dialed things down, but we're going balls to the wall. Well, if you look at their show, before you get in the numbers, you look at the two shows, Snowflake had their summit in person in Vegas. Databricks just had their show in San Francisco, and if you compare the two shows, it's clear who's winning. Snowflake is blew away from a, from a market standpoint. And I, we were at Snowflake, but we weren't at Databricks, but there's really nothing online. I heard from sources that it was like less than 3,000 people. So, and Dave, Snowflake yeah. was 1,900 people right. in 2019, nearly 10,000 yeah. in so 2022. I think it's going to be fun to sort of track that as, a, as an odd caveat to say, okay, let's see what that growth is. Because in fairness, Databricks, you know, a little bit younger. Snowflake's had a couple more years, so I'd be curious to see where they are. Yeah. Their, their lake house paradigm is interesting. Yeah, and I think it's and, it and really they're, is. And their product first company. Yes. Their go-to-market might be a little yeah. bit weak yeah, yeah. from our analysis, but, that, that, but they'll figure it out. The CEO is pretty but strong. But I think it's worth pointing out. It's like two different philosophies, right? It Snowflake is. is come into our data cloud, that's yes. their proprietary environment. They're the, they, think of the iPhone, <laughs> right? End to end, we, we guarantee it's all going to work and we're in control. Snowflake is like, hey, open source. No, bring Databricks. In, I mean, Databricks, open source, bring in this tool, that tool. Now, you are seeing Snowflake capitulate a little bit. They announced, for instance, Apache Iceberg support at, their, at the Snowflake Summit. So they are tipping their cap to open source, but at the end of the day, they're going to market and sell the fact that it's going to run better in native Snowflake. Whereas Databricks, they're coming at it from much more of an open source uh, a mantra. So that's going to, you know, we'll see who, the, lot of, look at, you had Windows and you had Apple. You got they both won. You got Cal and you got Stanford. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> they both can I don't think it's actually there yet. I, I find the more interesting dynamic right now is between AWS and Snowflake. It's really a fun tit for tat, right? I mean, AWS has the S3, and then you know Snowflake comes right on top of it and announces R2. We're going to do one letter, one number better than you. <laughs> they just seem to have this really interesting dynamic, and I and it is Slootman. No one's betting against him. I mean, this guy's fantastic. Yeah. So, and he hasn't used his war chest yet. He's still sitting on all that money that he raised. Five, to your point, that Databricks, billion. their timing just was a little off. Yeah, five billion in, in and they, capital. And Slootman hasn't used that money yet. So what's he going to do? What yeah. can he do when he turns that well, on, when making, he finds the right well, acquisition? They're making right some down, acquisitions. Right they did the Streamlit acquisition, yep, which Streamlit is a nice fantastic. little... Here's the problem with Databricks. Their valuation is underwater. Yes. So they're recruiting on their M&As yes. in the toilet. They cannot make the moves because they don't have the currency. Until they refactor the multiple and let yep. the, the, this market settle, I, I'm, I'm really now, nervous that they have to overfactor the uh, now, valuation. Having, having said that, to your point, point, Eric, the lake house architecture is definitely gaining traction. When you talk to practitioners, they're all saying, yeah, we're building data lakes, we're building lake houses. You know, it's a much, much smaller market than the enterprise it data is. warehouse, 
But nonetheless, when you talk to practitioners that are actually doing things like self-serve data, they're building data lakes and you know, it, Snow, I mean, Databricks is right there and is a clear leader in, in ML and AI and they're ahead of right. Snowflake. And I was going to say that's the thing, with yeah. Databricks you know you're getting that analytics at ML AI built yeah. into it. Yeah. You, you know what's ironic is, I remember talking to uh, uh, Matt Carroll, who's the CEO of Amuda, like four or five years ago he came into the office in Marlboro and we were in temporary yeah. space and we were talking about how there's this new workload emerging which combines AWS for cloud infrastructure, Snowflake for the simple data warehouse, and Databricks for the ML AI. And then all, now all of a sudden you see Databricks yeah. and Snowflake going at it. I think, you know, to your point about the competition between AWS and Snowflake, here's what I think. I think the Redshift team is, you know, doesn't like Snowflake, right. but I think the EC2 team loves them. Loves it, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so I think Snowflake is driving a lot of compute Yeah, to John's spend. point, there's plenty to go around. <laughs> yeah. And I think I saw just the other day, I saw somebody say less than 40% of true Global 2000 organizations believe that they're at real-time data analytics right now. They're not really there yet. Yeah. Think about how much runway is left and how many tools you need yeah to get to real time streaming use cases. It's complex, yeah. oh. it's not easy. It's going to be a product value a market. To me, Snowflake and Databricks, they're not going away, right? They're winning architectures. Yeah. In the cloud, what Databricks did with Spark and took over the Hadoop market, yeah. to your point, now that big data market has got two players, in my opinion, Snowflake and Databricks converging, while Redshift is sitting there behind the curtain they're a wild card. Yeah. They're a wild card, Dave. Okay, I'm going to give one more wild card, which is the edge. Okay, sure. and that's something that when you talk about real-time analytics and AI inferencing at the edge, there aren't a lot of database companies in a position to do that. You know, Amazon trying to put outposts out there, I think it runs RDS, I don't think it runs any From other database. End, yeah. Right, Snowflake really doesn't have a strong edge strategy. When I'm talking the far edge, the tiny edge. I think, I think that's going to okay. be HPE or Dell's going to own well, the outpost I, market. I, I think you're right, I'll come back to that. Couchbase is an interesting company yeah. to watch with Capella. MongoDB really doesn't have a far edge strategy at this point, but Couchbase does. And that's one to watch. They're doing some really interesting things there. And I think But they have to leapfrog Mongo, in yeah, my opinion. It, but there's a new architecture emerging at the edge, and it's going to take a number of years to develop, but it could eventually, from an economic standpoint, seep back into the enterprise. ARM-based, low-end, take a look at what Couchbase is doing. And they hired an Amazon guy. Very interesting. So they have to leapfrog, though. They need to, they can't incrementally. Who's they? Who? Couchbase, Couchbase needs, yeah. to, needs to make a big move and Well, leapfrog. I think they're trying to, that's what Capella is all about. It was not only you know, their version of Atlas yeah. bringing to the cloud Couchbase, but it's also stretching it out to the edge and bringing converged database okay. analytics. Real quick, on the numbers, any data on Cloudflare? I was, I've been sitting here <laughs> trying to get the word Cloudflare out of my mouth the whole time you guys were talking about that. Is this another that. company that's innovated in the ecosystem So with Cloudflare the super started cloud. out, it was really simple for them early on, right? They're going to get that edge network out there and they're going to still share from Akamai. Then they started doing exactly what Akamai did. We're going to start rolling out some security. Their security is fantastic. Maybe some practitioners are saying a little bit too much, because they're not focused on one thing or another, but they are doing extremely well, and now they're out there in the cloud as well. They got, so, S3 compar they got, yeah. they got an S3 competitor. Exactly, so when I'm listening to you guys talk about you know, a, a couch base, I'm like, wow, those two would just be an absolute fantastic you know, combination between the two of them. You mean Cloudflare and Couchbase? Cloudflare and yeah, couch yeah. Base, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got S3 alternative, right. you got a Mongo alternative, basically, in my opinion. And you, go, and you got the Edge, and you got edge, the edge Network cash with security. And security Interesting dynamic. This brings up the super cloud day. I want to talk about super cloud <laughs> because we're seeing a trend and we're reporting this since last year that basically people don't have to spend the CapEx to be cloud scale and you're seeing Amazon enable that. But Snowflake has become a super cloud. They're on AWS, now they're on Azure. Why not? TAM expansion, expand the market. Why not get that? And they'll be on Google next, all these marketplaces. So the emergence of this super cloud and then the ability to make that across a substrate across multiple clouds is a strategy we're seeing. What do you, what do you think? Well, honestly, I'm going to be really frank here. Though everything I know about the super cloud, I know from this guy. So uh, I've been following uh, his lead on this, and I'm looking forward to you guys doing that conference and that summit coming up. Uh, from a data perspective, I think what you're saying is spot on, though, because those are the areas we're seeing expansion in, without a doubt. I, I think, you know, when you talk about things like super cloud, and you talk about things like metaverse, there's, there's a there there. Look, every 15 or 20 years or so, this industry reinvents itself and a new disruption comes out. And I think you've got the internet, 
you've got the cloud, you've got an AI and VR la layer, you've got, yeah. you've got machine intelligence, you've got now gaming. There's a new matrix yeah, emerging, so super cloud, metaverse, there's something happening so out here. there that's not just your, your father's SaaS or IS or PaaS. Well no, it's also the spend too, right? So if I'm a company like say Capital One or Goldman Sachs, my IT spend has traditionally been massive every year. Yes. It's basically like tons of CapEx, in comes the cloud, it's an operating expense. Wait a minute, Amazon has all the CapEx, so I'm not going to dial down my budget, I want a competitive advantage. So next thing they know, they have a super cloud by default because they just pivoted their IT spend into new capabilities that they then can sell to the market in FinTech. Makes total sense. Right, they're building out a digital platform. That, would, that was not possible pre-cloud. No, it wasn't, because right. you weren't going to go put all that money into CapEx expenditure to build that out, not knowing whether or not the market was totally. there. But the scalability, the ability yeah. to spend, reduce, and be flexible with it really changes that paradigm entirely. So we're looking at this market now, thinking about, okay, it might be Greenfield. In every vertical, it might have a power law, where you have a head and a long tail that's a player like a Capital One, in insurance it could be Liberty Mutual or Mass Mutual, that have so much IT and capital that they're now going to scale it into a super cloud. And they have data. And they have the data and, and scales. Tools, right, and, the and they're going to bring that to their constituents yes, yes. and scale it using so, cloud. So that means they can then service the entire vertical as a service provider. And the industry cloud is becoming bigger and bigger and yep. bigger. I mean, that's really a way that people are delivering yep. to market, so. Remember, in the early days of cloud, all the banks thought they could build their own yep. cloud? Yep. Well, actually it's come full circle. They're like, we can actually build a cloud on top of the cloud. Right. And by the way, they're going to have a private cloud in their super cloud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know what's interesting is we're talking about financial services, insurance, all the people we know spend money. In our macro survey, do you know the, the sector that's spending the most right now? It's going to shock you. Energy utilities. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. The energy utilities industry right now is the one spending the most money. I saw largely because they're playing catch up, but also because they don't have these yeah. type of things for their consumers. They need the consumer app. They yeah. need to be able to do that delivery. They need to be able to do metrics. And they're the, they're, they're the ones spending right it's now. It's an arms race, but the, the vector shifts to value right. creation. So it's it just goes to back to your post, when it was a 2012, the trillion dollar baby? Yeah. It's a multi-trillion dollar baby that the, yeah. the world yeah. is going My after. My Jassy post on Forbes, uh, headline, trillion dollar baby, 2012, <laughs> you know. I should add happening. Yes yeah. on the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Trillions of babies. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, great to have you on theCUBE. Thank you so much, uh, guys. Great to bring the data. Thanks for sharing. Check out ETR. If you're into the enterprise and want to know what's going on, they have a unique approach, very accurate in their survey data. Um, they got a great market basket of, 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 of data, questions and people and community. Check it out, thanks for coming on and sharing. Thank you the guys, always enjoy. Okay. We'll be back with more coverage here in theCUBE in New York City live at Ada Summit 22. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.